Hello all, Michael Irwin from the DevRel team at Docker, and I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about containers, where we came from, and where the future's taken us. Let's jump right in, shall we? We're actually going to start off with a little bit of history lesson to provide a little bit of context and uh, and where we're going to go with the uh, the talk today. And we're going to start off by talking about a guy named Malcolm McLean. Now, many of you may not have heard of Malcolm McLean, but he's actually very pivotal in the shipping industry space. Um, and there's a lot of analogies with the space that we're in. Uh, in the software and, and platform space as well. Malcolm was born in the early 1900s in rural North Carolina. And after graduating high school, his family just didn't have enough money to, to send him off to college. And so what he did was he just started shipping goods. Um, so he, he worked for a, a, a truck line and he would move goods from North Carolina up to New Jersey. And eventually he saved up enough money to, to buy his own truck. In 1937, at the age of 24, he started he, he had this epiphany and he saw, you know, I, I take all these goods, um, such as, you know, packaged in, in barrels like this, like tobacco, and, and I, you know, put them into my truck and we take them up in the New, Jer New Jersey and we, I, I see them all taken out one at a time and get loaded onto a ship where it's then taken across the sea and basically the reverse happens. You know, they're taken out one at a time and put into another truck and sent across land, et cetera. And he actually had this idea of like, what if I could just ship my truck across the ocean? Now, for those that may not you know, have seen a cross section of a ship, now this is obviously a much older uh, ship, but the idea still kind of holds. You can see how much time and effort it would take to load goods onto a ship like this and you know, get it down to cargo holds and, and kind of play the Tetris game and figure out how to get the most out of the space that's provided on the ship. Um, you know, there's a lot of barrels up front and bags in the back and there's lots of thinking that has to be done to figure out how to balance the ship, et cetera. And so Malcolm had this idea of like, what if I could just buy an oil tanker? And so that's what he did. He bought an oil tanker, the SS Ideal X, and try something new. Now, the U.S. regulations at the time didn't allow him to own both a trucking line and a shipping line. So he had to sell off his trucking line. Um, but his first experiments were, can I actually take the truck and put it onto the ship itself and just then ship the truck? <laughs> Um, well, as you can imagine, there's a lot of wasted space there between the cab and all the space under the truck and whatnot. And so that didn't work out too well, but it got him going and thinking about it. And soon the, the shipping container was, was developed and the, the shipping container is the bedrock of much of or pretty much the whole shipping industry. Now there's ISO standards, uh, now, and you can even see circle in orange here, uh, ISO 1161, if I have the number right, uh, defines what these corner castings look like they're the shapes and dimensions and you'll you may be a little hard to see in the, the picture there but they're oval shaped um and i'll explain why that is in, in just a second but these these standardized shipping containers now as a goods producer i just get one of these boxes and throw whatever i want into it and i can the shipping industry then standardize or standardizes around this box they can have cranes that know the exact dimensions of the box and pull it off into a ship and put it onto a truck chassis, move it around the yard, et cetera. Um, the ships can have what are called twist locks that fit into that oval slot and then twist and basically anchor it, the container down uh, to the ship itself. Or you can have twist locks that then go on the top of one container and on the bottom of another to anchor containers together. Now, what's also cool about this standard is not only did it help out the shipping industry, but entire other industries have been created around these standards. In fact, I found a UK startup that has an entire accessory line um, for folks that have bought containers either for tiny homes or for container bars or whatever it might be that you can uh, attach security cameras or lights or other types of fixtures to these same corner castings. Um, again, all because it's standardized. Um, so Pretty cool stuff uh, in that space. But again, so Malcolm was thinking about this entire process and thinking about how do we how do we streamline it? How do we how do we make it better? And that's what's made the shipping industry what it is today. And this is a, a photo from the Shanghai shipping yard, uh, which is one of the busiest in the world. Um, and just the amount of throughput that goes through is quite fascinating. And in fact, some results, port turnaround dropped from three weeks to 24 hours. Shipping costs dropped from almost $6 a ton to $0.16 cents a ton. That's a huge savings. And then the, the chance of loss and theft dropped significantly because now the, the entire industry is focused around the steel box rather than individual bags, barrels, boxes, crates that can get ripped and you know goods pocketed and go home with.
whoever decided to take them. Um, so just a lot, a lot of benefits. And what was the key to success around this? Well, Malcolm focused on the, the entire system. And in particular, the handoffs between different points in the system. So the, the trucking line, when it went to the shipping line, how do we how do we smooth out that that handoff there, that that process between the, those different areas? Okay. In the software space, we've gone through much the same thing. Okay. And of course, I think most of you have seen this graphic before. We call it the DevOps loop. Hooray. Um, but really, what the, the whole DevOps movement has been really focused around is how do we smooth out these processes? What are the handoffs between these different areas so that we can plan, code, build, test, really deploy, operate, monitor as quickly as possible? How do we tighten that loop so that we're responding to user needs and user feedback, again, as quickly as possible? Um, and going back to the shipping analogy, we again, we've gone through this exact same paradigm shift where in the past, I would find bags, barrels, boxes, crates, and you know now if I want to run a Python app, the way I configure a machine for Python looks very different than Java, than Go, and Ruby, and PHP, and you know pick your language, pick your tool, and that's just the application. What about all the different services? You know your your databases and your your caches and everything else. It's just a lot of work, and now we want to deploy things as as quickly and as often as possible. Uh, Fortunately, now we have a, a standardized packaging model through the, the container, the OCI container specification that defines how do we package up these applications? How do we distribute these, these, these packages now? And then how do we run these packages? Okay, So in many ways, the shipping container completely revolutionized the shipping industry. Well, the software container ha has done the exact same thing in, uh, in the software space as well. And I know many of you already know that. Many of you already get that. Okay. But we're continuing to see further evolution on this because we're not done with this this revolution, this industry change yet. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, as I've watched over the years, is when containers first came out. You know, a lot of people are like, "Hey, cool! It works on you know the, the whole works on my machine, not my problem." You know, that that evaporates. And I think in many ways this was a a symptom of teams that were were building applications and they threw it over to the wall to an ops team or sys admin team and then that team would have to then run the application now of course that's a terrible like collaborative environment but it's another example of a handoff and so what ended up being developed was a hey fine teams you want to do containers you build it you run it yourself and so we started to see that paradigm start to come in where teams are then having to they're, they're building their containers either local on their machine or as part of ci cd processes and then they're running those applications themselves. And that's cool. Um, but one of the things that's that's started to evolve is as, as container-based development and production environments have become more just the way you do things, it's a, the utility. Now the 99% developer that's not quite so excited about infrastructure and everything else um, says, okay, cool, now that I have to run this, well, how do I run this? And they quickly see the CNCF landscape and they're just completely overwhelmed with, wait, there's all these tools. When do I use which? And how do I, how do I set up my, my clusters, whether I'm using Kubernetes or you know, a variety of, of different tools? Like, how, how do I do this? And it's completely overwhelming. Okay. And in many ways, I think that's what's driving a lot of what we're seeing now. And the whole reason we're here at PlatformCon is this idea of, this uh, yet another handoff here. Um, devs and platform engineering working together to figure out how do we how do we work together to solve our user needs. Okay, so where platform engineering can really focus on the platform and the infrastructure and and the you know SRE and uh, monitoring and, and uptime of the applications. Insert more buzzwords here, et cetera. And then the, the devs can really focus on I want to write my code. Okay. Now, most of you know that Docker's been in the space for many years and has gone through a lot of change and a lot of evolution and whatnot. But one of the things most of you may not know is that with the, the recent uh, refocusing of Docker, our, our main focus, our main vision can be summarized with this statement. Okay, Docker's vision is really to increase the time that developers spend on innovation and decrease the time they spend on literally everything else. Okay, so we want developers to be able to focus on their application code and delivering value to their users and not have to worry about all the other stuff that comes in. How do they set up their, their local development environments? How do they get their teams collaborating on their environments? How do they ship it? How do they build it? Um, like, let, let them just focus on their code. Okay, um, and I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing to, to help in that space. But 
really this is this is our goal so yes we're kind of going back to this slide here we're very much focused on the dev side of things now of course there's a handoff here and we want to do our best to help off help out with that um excuse me um but we're we're very very focused on the on the developer space okay um when when you look back at what helped docker be successful it was kind of fun going down memory lane i looked at a lot of blog posts from early 2018 17 16 etc and uh, a lot of the things that were talked about were were these things okay the developer experience wow i just run a docker run and all this magic happens i pull an image and kernel namespaces are set up in control groups and like it was all just a single command and it just was intuitive and it was easy um, the isolated sandbox and services i can run a a database and my cache and everything and then when i'm done it just evaporates and it goes away and i don't have to worry about how the you know if there's any cruft left on my machine afterwards extendable content that i can build off of somebody else's base and i can leverage their knowledge and their expertise you know i can start from a python official image rather than having to install and configure it myself and then the, just the vast community support that exists in our in the ecosystem it's, it's amazing and it's it's great to be in so the question is what's next where are we going to continue to evolve? And hinted at some of it with, okay, we're starting to see more and more of this kind of producer consumer mindset um, where there's those that are producing environments and producing container, Im container images, producing applications, et cetera. And then there's other groups that are consume it. How do we better consume it and, and run our applications in, in a variety of different ways? Um, but again, for the developer side of things, uh, you know, how do we help? folks better onboard because uh, we know that there's a lot to learn when it comes to Docker. Um, how do we help you onboard? Um, how do we help you discover the, the different images and things that are going on? Um, and I know my my, my camera's uh, feed is covering up a, a couple of the items here, but um, new dev features, Compose Watch, for example, and other improvements around networking speeds and vert IOFS to, to just make it easier and, and faster to do your development, et cetera. Um, so we're investing a lot of time into that. Another area that we're spending a lot of time in, you know, if we're if we're building these container images and we want to run them in production, we want to know what are we running. Okay, and so this brings up yet yeah, the new buzzword, uh, the secure software supply chain, um, and talking a lot about S bombs and these software bill of materials to help us know what's actually in our in our container image, and ideally, if we have an application running in our in our cluster somewhere. Um, regardless of the orchestration system, if a new vulnerability comes out tomorrow, how do we know what images are affected without having to go and rescan everything? If I've got this bill of materials, I can know immediately, hey, my containers running in my uh, my cluster environments, you know, containers X, Y, and Z are all vulnerable, but A, B, and C aren't. And I can look at the, these S bombs. Can I even be notified uh, of that? Or even get to the point of I'm getting automated pull requests to fix these CVEs. Et cetera. So there's there's a lot of a lot of neat things that can be done in that space, and um, our new product Docker Scout helps out a lot in this space, and we're excited to to be bringing that um, to the industry as well. Um, another big part that we've seen with the the Build X tool um, for those that are are building images, um, it captures now in the S bombs both the the runtime and build time uh, dependencies. So if you're doing multi stage builds, for example, how do you capture all the the dependencies in those other stages. So if you're doing, for example, a Java build, well, how do you know what JDK you're building, et cetera, um, in case there was a vulnerability there? There's also a lot of new emerging technologies, and this will play into platform selection and architectures as well, too. So if developers are wanting to start using WebAssembly, as, as an example, what changes does that bring to how we run our applications? Uh, there's a lot of really cool things going on in the WebAssembly space, and Docker is excited to be in this space as well. Um, and we're we're doing a lot with container D shims and be able to run these things on their own. But you know that's just one application usage of of WebAssembly. Uh, so again, there's there's a lot of new things going on, and it's all about making things easier and and trying to make things more approachable uh, to developers. At the end of the day, going back to this diagram again, it's all about the DevOps loop. How can we think of our entire system as a whole and think about the handoffs and trade-offs be between each of these different areas. So um, again, I'm excited to, to learn from each of you this week at, at, at PlatformCon. And if you have any questions or comments, concerns, feedback, feel free to reach out and uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks all.